to another Swedenborgian online community uh, reflection service and chat. Um, thank you for joining us today, whenever you catch this. Uh, we are an interfaith affirming, uh, very welcoming community um, based on the mystical Christianity of Emanuel Swedenborg and 18th century uh, scientist turned mystic uh, who wrote that heaven is full of diverse peoples of all kinds of different backgrounds, um, connecting together in different ways, uh, living a life of goodness, and heaven is a place also with us right now. So thank you for joining us and thank you all in the chat seat. Uh, hope you all are doing well. Hi, Albert and Ward, thanks for the greetings. Um, today we're talking about, uh, reflecting on near-death experiences in Emanuel Swedenborg. One of the um, reasons I uh, felt somewhat assured in Swedenborg's visions is because I had read a lot of near-death experiences and also watched many on YouTube um, that seemed to corroborate with a lot of his visions 300 years ago, long before uh, the famous Raymond Moody wrote his books on uh, the afterlife, life after life, and others starting in the 50s, I believe. And um, long before that, Swedenborg was writing about a similar topic with similar visions. A lot of interesting corollaries about seeing bright light, um, beings exuding love, uh, seeing your, your uh, loved ones, your, your past ones, um, immediately almost like they can teleport, things like that. Uh, pretty interesting stuff. And so we'll talk more about that and Reverend Wilma's reflections that I compiled for today. I was been reading through the archives trying to find something that would fit for today and I happened upon um, uh, a special couple months in 2012 and so I, I put some of that together for you and you can read that in swedenborgencommunity.org slash worship. So as we normally start our Sunday services, we will take a moment, gather our breath, and open our scripture on our cyber altar, <laughs> as Reverend Wilma so beautifully put. Whether that be a Bible or something else for you, representing how divinity speaks to us deeply through uh, scripture, through our life experience, uh, through our connection with each other. Let us also light our cyber candle representing the heat and light, the love and wisdom that we receive from the universe, divinity, Sophia, whatever you call her, Christ, the one, the all, that gives us life and illuminates our thinking. And before we read our scripture today, I would like to connect with those of you in the chat. William, are you having some trouble connecting? I hope you can. Greetings, folks. It's nice to, to have you with us and, and you who are listening live, too. There's a cosmic connection when we're connected, so lively, live, but also those of us who are reviewing this later, um, a deep, loving uh, connection, hopefully, which is what we're trying to foster in this community and uplift in all our communities, uh, no matter what our uh, theology uh, is. So our first reading today comes from Revelation, uh, the trippiest book of the Bible. And I want to do a little spiritual practice today uh, through part of it, and then I will read the rest. And as you probably know, we lean into our musical spiritual practices, our artistic endeavors, um, the things that enliven us and, and help us be more in the moment. And so I will be singing the first part of our reading from Revelation 21, starting in verse 21. Please hum with me, move with me as I do this. Then I saw a new heaven 
and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and there was no longer any sea I saw the holy city the new Jerusalem Coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her spouse. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and she will dwell with them. They will be his people, and Goddess herself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. For the old order of things has passed away. Thank you for joining me with that. Thank you, Lord for those words. Right now I'm reading them as a reassurance of um, a reality that we're not always that aware of, of an afterlife as many people will phrase it as an underlying life. It's the spiritual realm gives forth to this physical realm as Swedenborg may put it. Um, Revelation is quite trippy for a reason I think. <laughs> You know, I remember when I was younger, I didn't read it much, but I think it was because it was so crazy. It's like, okay, what? These things seem to have a rhythm or something going on, but way over my head. Um, you know, I think Swedenborg's visions and other people's near-death experiences kind of illuminate that this spiritual realm is trippier than most uh, of us would dream. Maybe not as trippy as our dreams, though. <laughs> Although... According to Swedenborg, they're, they're very much related. Um, and actually, in ways, it, it can become quite uh, confounding and still over our head even when we're dead and other places and other parts of heaven, hell. And, you know, I mentioned this as an interfaith uh, broadcast, and Swedenborg was very much interfaith, but he did see a hell. We have a video on it, uh, Is There a Hell, um, a podcast on it. And we talk about, okay, so what is hell in this interfaith light? Well, for Swedenborg, it's just people being themselves and not wanting to change from a dominating, um, selfish bent. And what's interesting is a lot of people have visions of hell in these near-death experiences that you can read on the web all over the place. There's some really popular uh, sites you can just Google near-death experiences and find some of the top ones. And there are cow after cow of of heaven, of hell, of interesting, just trippiness, of leaving our bodies, seeing things that are happening, even when they're brain dead, which is interesting. Um, because a lot of people will say, well, maybe their ears were still working. But uh, your, your brain, your neurons stop, stop firing when you're, uh, I shouldn't say brain dead. It's kind of funny, cardiac arrest is death if you never are resuscitated. But it's not called death if you are resuscitated. <laughs> so there's interesting terminology, we, we don't have to get into it. But, yeah, so there, there, people are having these visions all over the place. And a lot of them are near death. And so this 
term near-death experiences have has been coined and applied to this. And, um, you know, so the definition of near-death experiences is, quote, a profound psychological event that may occur to a person close to death or, if not near death, in a situation of physical or emotional crisis because it includes transcendental and mystical elements. And NDE, uh, short for near-death experiences, is a powerful event of consciousness. It is not mental illness. I think this is from one of this is from one of the near death experience websites, the I am site. Uh, greetings to to those of you who also joined in the chat seat as well. Nice to see you. Hope you're well. Um, and it's nice reading from Reverend Wilma about this subject because uh, she had an experience herself. I don't know if you um, got to that part in the reading, but she shares. Uh, she says she wasn't necessarily near death, although it sounds kind of scary. It uh, involves a bite from a cat and her veins turning red and other things. Um, but she had a, a near-death experience that she shares in those. I invite you to read it. And so, for many, like many of us, she's quite interested in this, and she highlights some accounts and, and also highlights what we're talking about already, which is Swedenborg's accounts interestingly correlate. And he even gives accounts of our um, general state after we die. And he does say, okay, this is like an average type of thing. This is not everyone. Every, some people have trippy things that happen that are during their life. Some things are different when they die. Um, but he kind of goes step by step through, okay, so you usually don't wake up immediately in your next, in the afterlife, but you have these visions, light, um, angels are guiding you, uh, you often see your relatives um, in the spiritual realm, according to Swedenborg. It's kind of like a quantum realm, that's what I like to relate it to, which is, you know, quantum, in quantum physics, which we're talking about in our book discussions on every other Thursday with the universe and I, when two particles are interrelated, it doesn't matter how far away they are, they, they're they almost speak to each other. You can interact with one and the other one's interacted with, even across the universe. And for Swedenborg, in a way, similarly, if you are close to someone, um, want to see them, care about them, and they're also feeling the same way towards you, um, you often appear to each other in the next life. Especially before we kind of work out where it is we want to uh, settle for a while and, and work and live and, and be joyful. Um, and so it's... It, it's funny that he highlights this fact that many people see their relatives and their friends when they die, and we see that all the time in these near-death experiences, um, people seeing their relatives. Um, and it's, it's interesting because I don't know of any compendium of near-death experiences before the 19th century, especially before Raymond Moody, but um, maybe there, there were. Uh, but Swedenborg is highlighting these things in the 1700s. Um, and so, uh, yeah, so as I, I mentioned, there's been a study of these by Dr. Raymond Moody, and he's kind of made his uh, name famous through them. And you can, you can watch some videos or listen to him in other podcasts. Um, and there's also recently been this interesting study called AWARE, and it's called Awareness During Resuscitation. And of course, it's in the UK because the US won't sponsor a study about uh, near-death experiences yet. Um, but in this study, they partnership with a number of different hospitals around the UK, actually, and, you know, uh, fully on board. And they reported to these doctors, these scientists, uh, a lot of them are medical doctors. Uh, Sam, Dr. Sam Carney, I believe, headed the research. Um, they would report when someone had a cardiac arrest and then didn't, and then didn't die, but came back. And all those people, the, this study tried to interview if they were alive by the time they got back, or got to them, I mean. And uh, many people, you know, they didn't get to everyone immediately, so they kind of, you know, some people had forgotten some things about what had happened, but they tried to get them as quickly as possible. And they found these interesting statistics. So they had 100 patients complete their stage two interviews 
46% had memories with seven major cognitive themes that this study had kind of distilled to um, indicate something like a near-death experience. Although the study also kind of problematizes that term. Uh, they like they like other other phrasing. Um, and those major cognitive themes include um, interesting love, fear, plants, and in the vision, uh, bright light, violence, persecution, deja vu, family seeing dead family members, recalling events um, post cardiac arrest, um, and so like they knew things were happening in their room after their heart had stopped and their neurons had stopped firing. Um, and then nine, so that's half, that's half of the people who had cardiac arrests that they uh, interviewed that got to stage two. And I think stage one is like, um, do you, well, I, I forget the, the qualifying thing. Maybe it's just, do you remember anything? Um, or do you want to talk? <laughs> but then 9% had, uh, and so 40 people dropped out from that stage one. 9% had NDEs uh, full on, so that's including, um, you know, every single, well, not every single marker, but a, a huge amount of the markers. Um, and you can find that study online as well. And so I want to just touch on some of um, the accounts given really briefly. Um, one account uh, shared actually by Wilma uh, says, In no time I was traveling down the tunnel with beings on either side. It felt like I knew them all, and they were talking to me, asking how I am and what had been going on in my life. They also showed me something that I could not recall, but it felt familiar. After a while with them, I was called towards the light, and I felt so overwhelmingly loving, peaceful, and knowing. I was asked a series of questions and given information about things by an angel with a staff and dressed in a warrior outfit, resembling an African chief. And then a decision was made that it was not my time, that I had a mission to fulfill, and that I will return. I cannot remember anything after that. Uh, then this person says, I woke up in the same bed in intensive care, and was told that I had died and was kept alive via ventilator and had been unconscious for one week. Since that time, I have had flashbacks and been aware that there are spirit guides around protecting me and guiding me. And they also feel like they're on a sacred mission and that they are back in the the world, the physical realm, to help people. And that's what, that, that account actually, if you've read many near-death experiences um, or heard them, is very similar to many people's accounts. They see the light as many people make fun of nowadays in TV shows and whatnot. Um, and they, they have people asking them questions. They feel like this overwhelmingly uh, loving presence uh, loving themselves, peaceful, uh, knowing. Uh, there's something called, uh, it's not all-knowing, but it's like a truth, truthiness, like in the air. Like they feel, not in a false sense, but like they feel like truth around them. They, and they've never experienced that before. And I'll share more about this um, in the future, but I also had something like a near-death experience, much like Reverend Loma, um, where I had a life review um, while I was seizuring, I was having a fit of some kind on the floor. And um, that's another interesting element of a lot of these near-death experiences, this life review. Uh, I know mine was way beyond anything I could have imagined for myself. Uh, and it also involved things that I would never remember. And it felt like it was written on my body. It felt like it was written on the environment. Um, and I started to realize certain things about my life, most of which I can't remember. There was a sense of truth uh, in that part and also in the things that came after, most of which I can't remember either. Sorry for uh, tantalizing it and not having much to say right now. Uh, but in this life review, I started to realize like I had been bitter for a long time. Like In the life review, I had been born that way. Crazy enough. Um, thunder just struck when I said that. And that's, it's funny because it's true. And I, I would never have characterized myself as bitter. And, or, you know, uh, some of the things that came after were very competitive. And I think a lot of times our spirits are hung up on maybe things that we carry from our families, um, who knows. And we can hopefully work through them to some extent. And for a lot of people in these near-death experiences, um, that's what they encounter are um, 
these reasons to live a more loving, uh, healthy life, to shed some of the old baggage, whether it's um, something that they've cultivated and I've, you know, I cultivated plenty of baggage on my own, or something that, you know, they've just been carrying, be it trauma, as we, we talked a lot about trauma last week and um, having fear due to these experiences. And it's interesting because reading through near-death experiences, I think it maybe it's the assurance. I think a lot of people respond to it, I do. But also just like the stories, the environments, they're, they're healing in a way. They speak to us um, of this underlying reality, I think, that we respond to to help us open up to, to say, you know what, like I should be more transparent. I should heal. I should allow these forces to heal me allow divinity to enter my life and um, help me change? What if there is this environment where kind of these masks are eventually pulled away as Swedenborg describes it and where our internal kind of motivations are revealed? Um, I was watching um, this clip of uh, this cartoon where the sh a shame, was, what was it, like a shame demon was like cast away and these kids started acting, you know, acting out but you know in a way that's how Swedenborg describes heaven and hell uh you know you eventually are the reputational uh, pressure that we feel on ourselves economic pressures even um are led up uh pretty much all the way in the next life and there are uh reasons to to change given but a lot of times that means we just are destructive because that's what we want to do and there's nothing stopping us so I find that, um, I find near-death experiences as illuminating in that way, helping us to, to ask, okay, what, what's our spirits? What are they like? What are they oriented towards? And what, what if I do live forever? What kind of life do I want to cultivate? And I think a lot of people um, who've had these experiences respond to that. They say, okay, well, I feel really sure. And a lot of these people, they're really, a lot of them were atheists. It, it doesn't really matter what their background were, uh, was. They they feel totally confident often in this afterlife, in this um, realm. And it changes their life. They say, okay, well, if I live forever, you know, I probably shouldn't lean into these really destructive things. You know, um, how, how can I uplift people? What, how can I be more like that being of, of love and truth, really? Um, and, and listen to them. And, and that's, that's really cool. All right, so... I want to take a second, look back in our chat seat, see what you all are saying. Oh, I'm glad it's working for you all. Yeah. Hope you all are doing well. Uh, Albert says, I met a guy here in Lincoln, Nebraska, who had a near-death experience, but hadn't heard of the expression or the fact that others, 20% of Americans, apparently, have also experienced it. I, I'd almost believe that statistic. Um, one of my professors at the... Graduate Theological Union shared a story of when she was in um, in class, uh, I think in in Boston, and the professor. I don't know what the class was, but the professor asked, you know, how many of you have had a near death experience um, in some way? I don't know how he described it, and no one raised their hands, and then one person did, and then half the room did, is how she put it, and I think that's how it often goes. We don't share these experiences we think okay well if i share it they'll think i'm crazy and it it's not just near-death experiences uh you know it could be mystical events of all kinds it could be other things even uh, you may even think you're kind of crazy for having them uh you know i think a lot of these events are somewhat related like even alien abductions it's interesting that alien abductions often have a light <laughs> shining down and then beings that are quite trippy um sometimes talking to you, interacting with you, um, maybe even connecting with you. Uh, you know, we don't have to get into the details of some of those visions, but, you know, I think it's interesting that, that it also relates to, like, going up into outer space, into this realm that's kind of mind-blowing. Um, and I don't, think it's a, I don't think it's a coincidence. Okay, so uh, to continue our chat about near-death experiences real um, quick, I want to highlight some of the uh, changes that seem to happen from near-death experiences. I, I was mentioning them, um, but according to uh, IAND, I-A-N-D, the organization around, one of the organizations around near-death experiences, 
Um, people tend to have a loss of the fear of death. Um, their near-death experiences come to love, uh, experiencers uh, come to love and accept others more easily. Most experiences develop a sense of timelessness, uh, often become quite intuitive. Uh, forgiveness usually becomes more important than criticism. Although the world is the same, the experiencer isn't any different, so the purpose of life seems more profound. Yeah, so one thing from my experience was like I felt like I was on a mission afterwards, like I felt like this high, and then over the next day it faded and I was like, wait, this is just life, it's the same, <laughs> you know? And it's interesting that they highlight that like experiencer, you eventually realize like despite that craziness that was way beyond my imagination, this is still life. So there, it must be closer to this life than um, I had known. And, and, and then you start kind of thinking through it in that frame, not the frame, okay, I'm special, but the frame, okay, this is, this is life. And so what does this have, how does it speak to life? Um, and that's something that they highlight in this. I think um, Swedenborg's book, Heaven and Hell, has a very similar effect on people I've met who've read it and, and read other Swedenborg uh, material. In fact, it may be even more profound in certain ways because some things, I think, are, are more detailed. You know, a lot of these new death experiences, including mine, we, um, details are missing. It may be short, you know, maybe just this loving being saying, okay, you got to go back. Yes, <laughs> as one of the experiences Reverend Wilma highlighted, uh, shared. And uh, Swedenborg, who had very similar experiences, according to him, of course, um, who published these experiences anonymously at first. Uh, he was quite famous in his time, um, and he was publishing these uh, in his 50s, 60s, and on. Um, he, you know, he highlights these experiences and these and what other people go through even after that initial stage. So he'll talk about people going, like meeting other people, going through societies, uh, discerning, okay, what what's the structure of this place? And he's like, well, uh, Maybe hard to fathom, but it's in the human form, uh, and that's what uh, his visions kind of entailed. And for him, humanity is kind of beyond how we would define it in this narrow vision, um, but more spirit, loving, living, intending, doing, acting, um, uplifting that love in creation. And he said all the spiritual realm is in that form as a whole, and also in each society, and then also every angel. And he calls all people in heaven angels, all beings in heaven, I should say, because um, he, was, he was a believer in aliens too, but uh, according to him and his vision, not many had a lot of technology. Uh, he, he, he actually said, of all the, the species that he sees in the afterlife, um, trippy enough, uh, the humanity has like the most technology, and he's like, people love books in the afterlife, so thank you, humanity, <laughs> you know, so that's, it's kind of funny, um, like the printing press or something, I don't know. A written written word um, but you know so for him he also has this element of like there is a moral component in a sense not to moralize but he does say like okay so heaven is this place where people eventually accept that and live into loving being good supporting each other in this interfaith community like even even though many of them just stay in their communities of XYZ religion they know that they're in this bigger uh, heaven. They know. If they're in heaven, they know. Um, and they feel the love, the joy from those other heavens shared with them um, to varying extents. And that's, that's the joy of heaven, is uplifting community, uh, doing useful things even in the spiritual realm. They're still doing stuff. A lot of it which centers on uplifting humanity in that realm and also in this and um, physicality and all those things um, you know so not a narrow idea of usefulness but more in the bountiful joyful sense of usefulness uh, that's what people are about in the spiritual realm um, and I think that's that's really illuminating uh, for our world here what we could be about could be an interfaith type of modality where okay yeah uh, the Quran really speaks to me and I get a lot of my good intentions from it. Um, this is an example person. and But I see other people looking at the Bible, looking at um, 
are they're wicked, and they're really about goodness. They really are orienting themselves, seem to be trying to, at least like I am, towards uh, loving kindness. Uh, maybe they're not religious at all in doing that, as many people are. Um, and, as, and I think that's the underlying message, is to lean into our goodness and support other people wherever they're at, excuse me, wherever they're at, um, in their goodness, in their walk. And with that, with the sign that I should turn to prayer, uh, I will start a prayer um, on air, and then I'll play some music, and uh, those of you in the chat see will share our prayers as usual. And then I'll come back, and we will uh, finish the prayer and um, continue and finish out our message for this evening. So thank you for bearing with me through this reflection on near-death experiences. Um, I will be playing music by Paul Deming called uh, Awake Ye Who Sleep. Dear Heavenly One, thank you for uplifting us in our lives here and now as it always is for us. Wherever we find ourselves, be it this world, in trial, in the underlying one, in joyful circumstances, let us lean into your loving kindness and in our intending. Let us accept your gratitude, our gratitude for the moment for all the gifts for us and for everyone who you enliven through your spirit. Help us to accept that our goodness is from you, that all the things that are substantial and working uh, for the upright and for uh, higher purposes are you within and through and around us. Please bless us as we turn more inward in our prayerful stance. Thank you, Lord, for hearing our prayers. Bless our walks this week, illuminating our uh, mind to make better and healthier decisions for our souls, our emotions, our body. Please bless our hearts, our minds to uh, 
accept more and more of your love, your goodness and intention, our concern for those things, our want to do um, loving acts and for getting them done, for being emboldened to live your love in this world, even in the midst of pain and illness, trauma and fear, and trouble and the world around us and our own spirits. Help us to see these things as the things we are receiving, accepting more of your love, projecting more of our destructive attributes as we find them with your holy presence. Amen. Well, thank you all for that. Thank you for your prayers and uh, the chapsy as well. And for, um, there's also, there is something in the news that I want to highlight. Um, we'll say as part of the prayer uh, for women um, in the world, in this country, who have gone through a lot of trauma, a lot of abuse, uh, primarily at the hands of men and but also um, the system, sometimes each other, and specifically this week with, uh, you know, the choice in the Supreme Court not to get too far into politics. Um, you know, we, our hearts are with those who are um, traumatized by um, that occurrence, and by other people in power who um, might have traumatized people abused, harassed um, in uh, many different ways. I know around the world it is an epidemic in our leadership, you know, whether or not you agree um, in a specific leader, it's all over the place. So um, our thoughts, um, especially our hearts, our, our concern for those situations and, and those people um, and for each of us struggling through. Um, a world like this <laughs> where things aren't revealed, uh, there aren't glowing beings yet uh, spreading love <laughs> and uh, upending the status quo, revealing who we are and asking us to change for deeper reasons. Um, we're not there in this realm, in this physical you know, realm, uh, just in our spirits. So let us lean um, into this realm with that loving, revealing, healing modality uh, as much as we can. And that is, uh, I think, the name of the game, folks. So I want to close out by reading something um, rather quickly from Reverend Wilma. And then after uh, this uh, live show, we will continue our coffee hour, <laughs> as we call it, in uh, Chatsy. You can find that at uh, swedenborgiancommunity.org slash discuss. It's also at chatsy.com slash swedenborg. Uh, so this is from Reverend Wilma, and this is after uh, the red line on her vein started marching up uh, due to the bite that she went through. She says, suddenly I was above my body and feeling incredible. I felt better than I had ever felt before. My mind was clear and sharp, and I felt so completely me. Most astounding was the presence I felt with me. Presence, capital P. I had never before felt so loved. It was not just love, however. It was a love that came from knowing me absolutely and completely. No one had ever known me as this presence did. And out of that knowing came perfect love. I knew that I could never do anything that would end that love for me. It is that feeling that remains with me since that encounter. I had never before and have never felt, never since, felt simultaneously totally known and totally loved. I felt that I was being asked a question. Did I want to come home now? It seemed to me that I had a choice. I didn't feel that I was at the moment of death. But it seemed that my infection could be cured or it could cause my death. I had a choice. 
I wanted to move deeper into this profound love and never leave. Yet there was so much more I wanted to do, be, and learn in life. With sadness, I said I wanted to return. As soon as that thought formed in my mind, I was back in my body, feeling sick. The R room door opened, and a doctor and nurse came in with an IV. I was hooked up to an IV antibiotic and put in the hospital overnight. At some point in the next few hours, an antibiotic finally took hold and the red line began to disappear. I was glowing with ecstasy for days afterwards. Something has been different in my life ever since. In even my darkest times, I remember being known and loved. I don't have the slightest doubting cell anywhere in my body that I will have that experience again when I leave my body for good. It has enriched my time here. I feel so certain that I will be home eventually that each day, each moment of earthly life feels more precious. Well, thank you, Reverend Wilma, for your presence with us this evening in the text. Thank you all for connecting with this interfaith community. Uh, catch us Thursdays and Sunday evenings. Um, also, uh, find our archives at swedenborgencommunity.org or on YouTube. Um, and go forth knowing that you are quite...